Howdy folks, Joe Howard here. All right, for folks watching on YouTube, check this out. Hey, looking pretty fresh, huh? Not too bad. It's got uh, a nice logo on the back there too, so you can rep MRR a little bit. Uh, we've got new shirts and the logo uh, here instead of being big and in the middle, so it's a little bit updated for this year. We've got some hoodies. We've got, uh, instead of you know the flat brim cap, we've got some ball caps as well. We've got water bottles, all, all the usual stuff. Um, so for folks who are just listening and not watching on YouTube, I'm pointing out a little bit of this uh, new WP MRR merch that I'm wearing that's kind of been launched for this year, 2021, but also like before the summit. I just wanted to have some new uh, swag this year for folks. So yeah, you can head over to store.wpbuffs.com forward slash MRR. Uh, if you want to check out the new MRR merch, you can also just click the uh, link in the uh, header and at the top of the page where you can just filter by MRR gear. You can see all the new stuff and you can order order some if you want. We'll probably be giving some away. We'll probably be giving away a lot <laughs> at the at the upcoming summit. But if you want to grab yours early, you're more than welcome to go ahead and, and do that. Actually, I wasn't even really planning to do this, but now that I'm thinking about it, why don't we do a little giveaway here on the podcast? This episode will go live on... August 31st. Okay, so use the discount code August31. So just August31 uh, and grab yourself free MRR gear. I'll create a dis that discount code. It'll give you like one free item and free shipping. So just like a totally free order. But here's a catch. I'll only make it available for five people. So when you hear this, go grab your free merch before it's... Uh, that discount code's used up. Probably will uh, will go pretty quickly. So cool, new merch. at one summit update. Um, another is just that we've had some speaker announcements happen. So if you're registered already, you're in the WPMR community. You've seen those uh, announcements come up. But I'll give some quick shout outs to our recently announced speakers. I'm gonna run through them quickly. Kim Coleman, Chandler Jameson, Brad Williams, Suraj Sodha. Melanie Fung, Danielle Bassana, Dean Burton, Erin Flynn. Uh, those were the eight on our first announcement. And second announcement post here, Kimberly Lipari, Kyle Marr, Ryan Sullivan, Joe Howard, whoever that is, uh, Augustin Pratt, Carrie Dills, Nick Adams, and Christy Chirinos. Uh, yeah, we've got a great lineup of speakers. I think I've only announced like maybe two thirds of the speakers so far. So more announcements to come, but great lineup so far. Uh, again, feel free to go ahead and register for that summit coming up on September 21, 22 and 23. It's about a month from now. Just sign up to be a member of the WPMRR community at community.wpmrr.com and you'll automatically be signed up for updates and notifications when that live stream goes live right in the circle community. So, all right, that's cool. That's our, those are our more summit-ish updates. Um, community updates. Uh, one community update I did want to mention was I posted uh, a lightning chat that I had with Steve Burge. Um, Steve's done a, a bunch of stuff in the WordPress uh, space, WordPress community, has launched a bunch of products, but he's working on this product called Logtivity. And I posted this video where we talked about uh, a little bit around SEO and around integration marketing uh, and some ideas about how he can grow monthly recurring revenue for his his new SaaS product, which again, is called Logtivity. Uh, I posted this in the 10K MRR goal space um, because that's just the, where uh, Steve is with his current, that current product. And yeah, cool video here. Folks can tune into that. Um, there's audio, so people can just download the audio and listen it that way if you want. I had I added a bunch of notes here: uh, background, SEO, some screenshots, additional resources, integration, marketing. A lot of notes here, so people can come in. And if you're into this kind of stuff, you can uh, get involved. You can like, you can comment, but you can also just learn from it. So hopefully that is helpful for people. Just a little update around something that's going on in the community. Okay, cool. Summit updates done. Community updates also done. Let's get into today's episode. So this week I got to sit down and chat with Gary Gaspar. Uh, now Gary runs a, again, we're kind of staying in the software SaaS world. He runs uh, this SaaS product called Marker. 
and I enjoyed talking with him this week because it gave me, instead of just talking about like developing a WordPress plugin or running a services company, I got to talk about SaaS a little bit and think about how SaaS or software as a service fits into the WordPress ecosystem. So uh, a few pieces about today's episode. Gary is one of three co-founders, which I think is not super normal. Most people either are self, you know, solo founders, or maybe they have, you know, it's two people, but three is different. So hearing about how all that came to fruition was was definitely eye-opening. And we've talked a lot about hiring and finding great people for your team and how some people go through formal processes to do that. You know, we got to hear about Gary's strategy of meeting one of his first, you know, big hires at a party and going through and hiring him through that. So that was a definitely maybe like a non-traditional way of meeting a, a good new hire, but it's worked for him so far. So we talked a little bit about that. And yeah, similar to this conversation I had with Steve in the WPMR community, we talked about lead generation, a lot about lead generation, a lot about how to do that via integration marketing. Gary had some really good ideas. And I think he's definitely on the right path to, you know, growing marker through some integration marketing, through, you know, being involved in the WordPress community, through all of that. So boom, that's all. Cool. Let's get into the podcast today. Uh, please welcome Gary Gaspar. Enjoy today's episode. All right, we are live this week with uh, Gary Gaspar. Gary, tell folks a little bit about what you do with WordPress in the WordPress space. Hey, Joe, thanks for having me on. So I started a company called Marco.io, and basically we help businesses, mostly digital agencies, collect feedback from their client on digit on websites uh, obviously a lot of agencies are building on wordpress so you know we also released a new wordpress plugin so the whole idea is to help with qa testing and help you know clients give feedback to the to the agency in a very streamlined way cool man so tell me about like the ideal application or applications for marker and if people want to check it out it's marker.io people who are watching on youtube already know because they see your t-shirt there um but tell me about the like how would an agency use marker.io so i'm on the website and it's you know the the what i see on the home page is just reporting bugs shouldn't be rocket science get website feedback from clients and colleagues into your favorite bug tracker without driving developers crazy so it's sounds like, you know, if someone's building a WordPress website and you have client feedback, you know, I want to do X, Y, and Z, it's a way to, uh, the piece of software that kind of lives in the middle so that clients can give you feedback on this website. Oh, I want this, you know, edit done in the header, or I want this piece of copy changed, or this slider needs to have a different image here, and maybe even some more technical things that we, that can then kind of be translated into, actual bug reports for an agency's development team? Is that in general how it works? Yeah, exactly. And I think what's uh, very interesting is understand the, the the backbone story is actually before Marco IO, I had a, a WordPress agency and we were building websites for, for these, uh, for our customers. And, you know, a lot of time this process of collecting feedback from client, you know, it's a lot of email, a lot of phone calls. Some clients would send like, you know, spreadsheet and PowerPoint so file. Was like, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? Like the, the, the smile yeah. on your face tells me you, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's, I'm, it's like a painful smile. <laughs> I know <laughs> that, that pain point. <laughs> exactly. So, so did I. And so basically what we did is we wanted to create a way for our client to be able to, you know, those uh, little live chat widget a la intercom, something very similar to that, but instead of opening a live chat, it would just like capture a screenshot. You could add annotation with built-in annotation tools and then fill out a a few fields in the form and then send it off. So that's like super useful in and of itself. But Mm. as an agency on the back end, I wanted to create something where I wouldn't just get those in my email inbox because it would defeat uh, def- defeat the whole purpose, right? And back at the time, we were using Trello for to manage all our projects. So for each new client, we would create a new Trello board. And, you know, I would have to like put all these requests in from our customers into, into Trello. And so what we wanted to do is say, hey, look, our team is working day and night in Trello. Let's connect the WordPress site or whatever site we're doing at the time with our, our our Trello board. And so 
now that our client has sent that feedback through the widget, developers or PM log in into the Trello and then they have like this beautiful formatted card with a very clear screenshot with annotation uh-huh. and everything and all of that. They have on which page, you know, it sounds stupid, but which page were you actually seeing when you saw that <laughs> bug or, yeah. or you had that, you know, thing that you wanted to, to give feedback on. Uh, and then, you know, browser, <laughs> no more like needed to ask which browser were you using, stuff like that. And a bunch of more technical data. We even record more advanced uh, data like console logs if it's a very technical mm-hmm. bug that might happen. And uh, and okay. so, yeah, that's why in our tagline we say without driving developers crazy because we just give them the right info in the right place mm. with their everything that they need. Yeah, I'm checking out just in the top menu your integrations. And it's like, whoa, big menu of a ton of integrations come up. And I have, a, I think, a little bit of even a clearer picture now because I'm seeing project management tools and issue trackers. So... And, and some more stuff, you know, you have your WordPress plugin here, but project management more for the kind of edits I was talking about, like your traditional, like I need some basic feedback from, I built the website, oh, here's this copy, it needs to be changed, like that would be, that would be something that could probably go into project management software, but if you have, if you're doing bug tracking, uh, that's a whole nother, uh, you know, you want to be integrated into GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket or any of these you have here. Um, the one that actually stands out here is, is Clubhouse. What does the Clubhouse integrate? do yeah well i think uh, you're not familiar you might not be familiar with the clubhouse project management app and it's actually not the clubhouse audio app oh, it's a different clubhouse <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. That makes more sense <laughs> and i saw actually, clubhouse and i was like oh is this like are we doing some more like marketing here oh, okay it's a different kind of clubhouse <laughs> okay so there's i guess multiple sorry sorry clubhouse that was a project management software you got overshadowed in the last year or so but yeah I, i'm actually other. following them on twitter and they they just announced that they are going to change their name because it's <laughs> it's been overwhelming oh, for them like i think they spent half of their day just replying to social messages say hey you tagged the wrong clubhouse account <laughs> <laughs> oh wow well hey at least they're making moves so yeah cool man um you talked a little bit about the um moving from being an agency and building websites for folks into being, you know, running a software company. I want to dive more to that story because I know we have listeners who maybe actually similar to myself or agency owners or freelancers or do a productized service or they're a services company, but they have, you know, this idea in the back of their head that like maybe someday I could do a WordPress plugin or I could do a SaaS product uh, or a software business. That sounds really cool. So I'd love to dive a little bit more into that story. And as part of that story, I do want to touch on the part of the story of you having three co-founders for the company and how that kind of comes into part of the story. I was on your team page because I wanted to see what kind of stage you're at. looks like you have six or so team members and three co-founders. And I don't often see three co-founders. A lot of times I'll see two. I'll, uh, pretty often it's one, but three is a little different. Sounds like It looks like, I think I'm remembering right from the website, one of you is CEO, one of you is uh, uh, CPO, which I assume is chief product officer. Uh, and the third is uh, C... Keo. Third... Yeah. CTO, CTO so of course, CTO. I was basically, like, which, I'm forgetting an obvious one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all fancy terms to just to say there's a design and product guy, there's a tech guy, right. and then there's a business guy. <laughs> totally cool. So I'd love to hear the the started as an agency, but I'd love to hear us like dig into that a little bit more. Like, when did you decide you wanted to move forward on creating a software product? How did that transition go of moving from agency work into software? Did you hit this MRR, you know, you're either a subscription revenue point where you were like, we just got to go full time on this. Like, talk me through that transition. Yeah. So, uh Speaking for myself, I've always I've always had this entrepreneurial bug from the very start. So very early on, I knew I wanted to go into business for myself. And I tried a bunch of things. After university, I went to work at a very corporate job and really didn't like it. Complete quit everything when I uh, moved to a big city and then start uh, tried to start my own thing. But I was very young and very naive, so I had no idea what the hell I was doing. So uh, after about six months, a year, like, you know, I'm just going to call it quit on this thing for a little while. And I went to work for, uh, for a startup. 
and um, it's in the SEO space. It's called WooRank. They're still around. And uh, I basically learned a lot there, digital marketing, product management, a lot of stuff. And I actually met my two co-founders at this job. So uh, we mm. we started to to get along. And then they pretty much had the same idea, wanted to do a thing on their own as well. And so one of the co-founders had already started a side gig uh, together along with this existing job where he was building, you know, website for folks like you, like you said. So a small agency. Then, you know, it started to pick up steam. He went full time, quit his job. And then I talked to him and I say, hey, man, I'd love to, you know, join and maybe we do something together. And I knew that I wasn't, I, I wasn't sure I wanted to be full into service long term. But I thought it was just a great opportunity to to learn, to meet clients, to you know, understand all the ropes of building a, a website, uh, a business, mm. and um, and so I went and helped him out. The third friend uh, quit his job to to do some freelancing, and we say, hey, we have a spot in our office. You know, come and sit uh, next to us. Next thing you know, you know, we're like, hey man, we should work together. So we joined as uh, with the agency. And off we go. We we're the three of us like doing our agency and we had the perfect mix of, as I said earlier, like tech, design and business. And so we, on the side, we um, launched a lot of products because we've always wanted to create a lot of pro uh, a product based business. And I think a lot yeah. of folks listening want something similar. And well, put it bluntly, like we failed a lot <laughs> and to the point where the, 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 the agency was about to go under because we couldn't focus on two businesses like this mm. for, for too long, right? So we How many almost, different products do you think you, you experimented with? Uh, the three of us in this agency setting, probably like four or five really legit things that we tried and, you know, build out for months. And it's a lot of things to try, put all your effort into. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And then one day we're really close to, you know, go out of business and we just said, hey, you know, whatever is our next big idea, because we always had like big ideas, it needs yeah. to be something we are going to use ourselves and it needs to have like a prototype in two or three weeks tops. We won't be spending too much time on this anymore. And so, you know, one day I was doing a, where we built a huge web app for a, one of our of our client at the time. And I was doing a lot of uh, QA testing and bug reporting. And this whole process seemed completely broken to me. I had to cop take screenshot, copy paste it. And then when I had to collect feedback from client, it was a big mess. And so we created like a, at the very beginning was a browser extension. You click, take a screenshot, and then that was sent into like, a Trello board, and there was nothing else much to it. And uh, yeah, we put it live and then did a little bit of push here and there. And soon enough, we had our first paid customer. And that was like a revolution for us, you know, because, <laughs> you know, you might sign, you know, 30, 40K contract and service, but then you get five bucks for a monthly subscription on product. And uh, yeah. all of a sudden, you're like super pumped. And um uh, and so, yeah, we, we thought that maybe we might have something there. And then uh, we obviously didn't want to drop the entire business, uh, existing business. So we worked at it for a little while longer. And when we felt like uh, uh, MR was growing to a point where we could ded dedicate a bit more to it, we were not yet able to go full time on it because, you know, MR takes a while to build up. And so what we did is one of the team member was almost in charge of managing the agency. And then the other two were out building uh, Marker.io. And that period of time lasted for about a year or so, maybe. It was really tough. That was a really tough period because we were not on the same, you know, not on the same bandwidth. And it, yeah. we're, we're with some of you working full time and one person working more on agency stuff. It's kind of a different way to be able to split, you know, your attention. If you're one person, you could maybe like, you know, do your daytime work and a full time job and do it in the nighttime another. But it's also possible to do with three people, just maybe one or two are working full time on the new project and one is working full time on the old. It does make that communication hard. 
Yeah, and especially in terms of like the energy and the flow, because you come up with all these ex exciting, creative ideas. And then your co-founder is like, man, like I got to manage this client right now. I can't have my head yeah. in there uh, at this at this time. So uh, it was tough, but eventually we were able to get to a point financially with Marco.io where we could shut down the business. It took us about six months because, you know, you always have the, your mm. existing clients that you just don't want to throw out the door and then transitioning uh, into in the product business. Yeah. Do you remember what about those MRR points were? when maybe one when you decided like one or two of us are going to go full time on it and we were able to do that financially and then do you remember the MRR point where you were like fuck it we're all doing it let's go let's build this business together everybody full time um yeah i wouldn't or know ARR that. in your point because it's you may be doing some annual pricing too yeah i would definitely say that the the idea of having part of the team working on the project and the other one in the agency it wasn't much of a financial metric that led us to do that. It was more of a leap of faith of like, man, we have something here. Okay. And um, so it was more, yeah, just wanting to do it this way. And then just completely shutting down the agency, I would say maybe around 10K, uh, well, maybe even before that, probably even a little bit before, I don't know, 10K. But we are a small company anyway, so, you know. Right. Yeah, with I think it's probably that number to push everyone to full time is probably a little bit different with, with three co founders as it is to, as it was like WP Buffs when I was one co founder. But I, it was around 10K MRR when I went full time on it just as one person. So it's funny how I think different, you know, not I think different people have different risk tolerances. So three people may say like 10K, let's do it. And you may not, your salary may not, you know, your, whatever you're paying yourself from that may not be as high, but you may be able to, you may, you know, you may not want to work that full-time job anymore. You may have been more confident in the business model than I was at that point. You know, if you have, if you're at a hundred dollars MRR, if you're confident in it, you know, that it's going to grow and that's okay to jump and do it then as well. So, you know, but we have in the WPMRR community, we've, I've created that 10 K goal space because I think every business is different. Obviously that's true. But in general, if you can like have this like milestone of 10K monthly recurring revenue, like you should be pretty comfortable going and doing that full time and paying yourself a fairly livable salary. Maybe if you're in like the, one of the highest, most expensive places, you know, in the, in the world, it may be tougher, but 10K is really good. Mark, if you can get there, I think you can, you can most likely go full time in most contexts. So it sounds like that was the point where you said, all right, we're, we're going for it. But you're totally right. Like the context and your risk tolerance is a big factor because we we're pretty young back then. And so we didn't have to pay ourselves. We just had to pay ourselves like enough to get by. And totally. for us, you know, it was just like, let's do it. We were, I don't know, when we completely shut the agency, we were maybe 26, 27, something like that. I can't remember exactly, yeah. but we're still in that. Um, yeah, that mood where we wanted to 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 build something, and uh, yeah, I would say we started to make like a decent living maybe a year or two ago only, you know. So for it's been it's yeah. been like a grind. I feel you, man. I I'm not gonna lie. There are lots of benefits to being the majority owner of a business that does about a million and a half dollars a year. I'm not gonna argue that, but I I kept my I've kept my I, my salary is still low. My like my salary is probably still below the average of what like a C-suite employee is. As is a lot of team members for a lot of smaller businesses, C-suite positions for smaller businesses. But um, I feel very similarly. Like I never paid myself that much. I almost always paid myself enough to get by maybe a little bit more than that some points you know maybe if i wanted to you know give myself a little you know a little couple thousand dollar bonus here and there to do something special for my family or something yeah maybe i do that but my salary like even today it's like it's not very high because i i've 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 found that and maybe you would you may agree with this that i can live pretty simply and be fairly happy with a pretty modest salary and the value of having ownership over a company uh, or ownership of a company has its benefits too. So it's kind of like no matter whether your money is like 
putting being put back into the business or it's part of your salary. Sometimes it's actually, and often it's probably better to put that back into the business because it's the biggest um, asset you probably own. Uh, maybe I'm making an assumption there for some people, but maybe for me, it's the biggest asset I own. It's also the biggest thing I can most easily grow. So why not keep the money there and pay myself a low salary? So I think it has multiple benefits. So I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I feel like I'm at church now because everything you're talking about <laughs> it sounds exactly right to me. And right I on. mean, you know, as I said, uh, after I, 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 I finished university, you know, I had a pretty corporate traditional job. And then after two years, I, I quit to do my own thing. But then all your friends that you were at university with, they're, you know, starting to get better cars and better salaries and fancier things yeah. here and there. And so it was a bit of a, you know, at first I was like, eh. But now I really, it really resonates with me what you say about living simply because it's really about what you decide to prioritize financially speaking. And for me, it's just, you know, I don't buy a lot of clothes. I don't, for me, it's just maybe, you know, going to rest, going out, restaurant, friends, uh, and traveling. But then again, now I'm also traveling while working. So, and then that's, that's, that's good enough. Yeah, that's that's probably pretty similar to me. It's like I do a good amount of traveling, but like people know who are listeners, like I lived in D.C. for a long time. I'm in D.C. right now. D.C. is really fucking expensive. Like it's way cheaper to be traveling almost anywhere else in the world than just like live in D.C. So I've actually, we've made a lot of changes recently to actually like minimize our financial need and stuff. And it's in a lot of cases makes life way better. So, okay. I, I also want to dive a little bit into like, I want to dive into marker.io now, status, what's going on right now. Uh, you have six people, six-ish people on the team now. So you've, I guess, doubled since the three co-founders came together and hired a, a few more people. Um, what's going on with the business now? Like, what are your big goals moving forward? Uh, I don't know, maybe the next like six months, what plans do you have? Right. So... We, it took us quite a while to find that product market fit and that right positioning and that right message that really worked with people. But I think we, we got to a point about a year ago where we hit that. So now we really foc we're, 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 we've worked from the, from the bottom up. So product, now we've added a lot. Uh, we put a lot of effort into customer success, uh, support, uh, product marketing, website, and we've actually hired uh, another Joe on the team to actually handle that nice. part of the on the business. <laughs> and um, he must be good. He must be awesome. He must exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He's super nice. He's Irish, so like he has the the best personality. But yeah, anyway. Um, and so product is really good now. Customer success support, and now we're starting to add that extra layer of pure acquisition obviously we're growing and we have stuff that are working uh, seo is working really well for us um integration marketing is very very good as well and now we're uh thinking about okay how can we you know grow the double the ar in, in a yeah. year or something like that and that's really going to be more focused on like pure acquisition plays Cool. One thing you just said, I would love to rewind to talk more about because a lot of we're doing this WPMRR virtual summit coming up. And from our 2020 summit, one of the biggest things people asked about was customer acquisition. It was right. how do I get customers in the door? I think a big advantage of subscription revenue is you don't just have to like the only growth you focus on is not just getting new customers. It's also you can reduce churn to grow. You can, you know, oh, yeah. upsell people with new features so that they have a higher lifetime value. That's another growth trigger. And it's not just new customers, but a lot of people do still struggle with getting that, you know, to get monthly recurring revenue, you have to get someone to swipe their credit card once. So the first time they have to give you the credit card. So uh, the thing you touched on was integration marketing, which is a topic that I'm like, oh, I want to talk about that. I don't think we've ever like specifically talked about that on the podcast before. So I love this idea. It's, I think it's in some cases a little more SaaS than it is services, but I think that for WordPress plugins, there's like the WordPress plugin repository, you know, for services company, there's like, you know, if you're an agency or a care plan company or website management company, you can be listed in 
like other companies directories so that people can find you. So it doesn't just apply to product companies, but you mentioned that and I feel like there's a really good amount of marketing you can do based on all those integrations I saw in your top menu, like all those companies you integrate with. You can contact them, you can talk with them. Hey, how can we work together? What could we, how could we benefit, is what we do beneficial for your folks? Like maybe we could get listed here or something. You know, there are a bunch of different ways, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about how maybe you, maybe your marketing person are tackling that. Yeah, so it's almost in our DNA of the product because we've built this entire Mark.io product with integrations in mind. Because as I said earlier, we're using Trello. And so it's almost as an add-on to, to Trello. And then uh, as we went on, we, uh, we started adding more integration. And so, yeah, I actually, every time we uh, uh, launch a new integration, I reach out to, to the folks over there. Uh, and then some people are really nice and want to help them uh, you know, help us grow their ecosystem because to them it's also a win-win because the more tools they're going to use that plug into the project management system, the more people are going to be locked into the experience, right? So they really want to help you, you know, make their app better in a way. And so some people are really nice and really helpful. And obviously we do the basic of being listed uh, in their marketplace when they have one. And when you think about it, like, okay, it's maybe more of a product thing than a service thing. But when you think about it, what it is at the end of the day is just being where your customers are. And for us, our customers are Trello customers, Jira customers, GitHub customers. And we just want to say, hey, you're in this world and you think about these kind of problems. Like, we're a good tool for that. And so mm. it's also a, a good way to, to, to think about this. And what we're trying to do now is also develop partnership with partners where we can now we've one of our partners is teamwork.com. It's a project management tool. And we've recently we did uh, <laughs> oh there, there you go. Well, they're one of the very uh, super supportive partners. And we actually did a co-hosted webinar with them. So we put together mm -hmm. a webinar with me and someone on their team. And then we just emailed the database and say, hey, teamwork customers, uh, are you looking to improve your, your QA testing and your client feedback process on your website? We've put together a webinar. And so it's really about exchanging this audience, these audiences and uh, yeah, just having a very on-point message and with very strong intent. Yeah. I, I really like what you said about making sure that the integration partners you work the most closely with and probably any partners you're working the most closely closely with, you want to make sure that their customers are the kind of customers that are going to be good target customers for oh, yeah. you, which I think a lot of people may not think about first and foremost or at all because a lot of people will be like, I want to work with someone. Oh, it's like a big company or like they have a good brand name or they have a high domain authority and like getting a link back from that site would be good. But like none of that's really like top priority value. Like the most valuable thing is like getting in front of an audience that are like high quality potential customers for you. So if that's teamwork customers, that's great. You get on a joint webinar, you provide a ton of value and then you see the conversion probably higher because oh, yeah. people use teamwork. Well, there's probably a bunch of agencies out there who are using teamwork and have challenges like getting that QA information, gathering it, getting it into teamwork, organizing it in teamwork. We have that <laughs> teamwork is like it really easily becomes unorganized if you don't stay on top of things. So like if you can solve those pain points for people, like I bet a ton of people have those and teamwork is probably not going to solve all of those challenges, especially if it's like a little bit outside of their scope, right? So you can come in and be a solid partner. You take care of challenges for teamwork that they're not going to take care of or that they just don't want to. It's not in their wheelhouse. And you serve their clients in a way that will probably benefit teamwork as well. And of course, it benefits the clients who are working with you. So I think that that's a good way to think about when you, when you have, you know, 20 choices of who you want to really you know, dedicate time and energy to a relationship with, like better to pick five that are going to be really, really, really good fits than to try and do 50 who you're just going to like kind of throw spaghetti at the wall and see what fits. Not that that doesn't have a benefit at some point, but when it comes to your time and your energy, at some point you have to like double down on what's working and toss what's not working. And yeah, and, and I have a, done, a, a, 
I have a funny anecdote on this is at the beginning, since we have a browser extension, we also had a free plan. Funny enough, we used to have a lot more traffic than we do now on our website because originally, and that's by design, because originally we we're trying to push this smart screenshot tool uh, mm. and with a free plan. And so a lot of people are looking for like a nice little screenshot tool. But then not only did it not convert in the back end, the conversation you were having in support were like, oh man, this is not at all what we're trying to build here. And so we were mm. just attracting a bunch of people that we didn't want to eventually do business with. And so we actually changed our positioning. We actually gated some stuff to make it a bit, to introduce a bit more friction, to really yeah. make you feel like you're motivated to go yeah, through yeah. the process. And like, obviously all our conversion rates went up because... The traffic mm. went down, conversion rates went up, and bottom line also went up. So it's, yeah, all, sometimes you think about, you know, traffic, 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 but what you're really looking is for customers, as you correctly said, and you want to go to the places where those customers hang out and not just hang out in the state of mind that, you know, you want them to be in. If your teamwork and you're struggling to get client feedback, then you're in this state of mind. But if, you know... Maybe when, when you, once you're on Facebook and you might have that problem, but that intent is not there at this moment. So the channel fit doesn't quite work. And so, yeah, integration marketing, I love it. It's, it's, it's been really cool. Yeah, cool, man. Okay, so SEO, working for you, doing some SEO, investing in content, driving targeted traffic through search engines, getting folks to, you know, maybe start that free trial uh, or to have other KPIs. I don't know, download an ebook, join an email list. There's some a million of those. So that's one. Integration marketing is a second. I'd be interested to ask about more, a little bit more about customer acquisition channels because I found like WP Buffs, we grew from SEO early on pretty quickly. And that really quickly grew to be like, it drove like 90% of traffic to the website and like 90% of lead generation and 90% of new customers. Um, since then, we have, because we were so invested in SEO or so such a significant percentage of driven revenue came from SEO, it was like, ooh, like we actually have to diversify this now because if Google penalizes us one day, then we're kind of screwed in terms of driving new revenue to the co to the company. So we've kind of moved into this affiliate track as well. Now that's our kind of second biggest driver. And we've started to experiment with a few other customer acquisition channels. So I'm interested to hear about what you're up to now. Or do you feel like you're still at the point where SEO and integration marketing are like, those are your two things for now. They're doing awesome. You know, there's a pretty good split between them. And there's still a long way to go in terms of like, low-hanging fruit in terms of a lot of that. So we're just going to keep focusing on that. Or are you at this point where, hmm, maybe it's time to experiment with a couple other things? Right. So the way we think about it is if it works, keep doing it because up until you reach that point where you have diminishing returns, you should do, go ahead and do it. So integration, marketing, we're always going to do it. SEO, we're always going to invest in it. But it's true and the que the timing of your question is perfect because these are the things that we're thinking about. Like me being on this podcast, you know, it's actually the first time I'm doing a podcast and, um, you know, it's a channel that I'm experimenting with and it's, and, and it's fun and you get to learn as well. And, you know, you in the WordPress community. So I almost approached it the same way I approach it with my integration partners. I'm like, okay, we just released that WordPress plugin. Let's go and dive into this WordPress world. Obviously, your name came up pretty fast, a few other people uh, out there. And I was like, me, I need to build relationship with, the, with, with these folks mm. and expose my message to this audience that is in the right state of mind. So, you know, a little bit of a community uh, being more, uh, you know, um, uh, more active in communities. That's something we're playing uh, with, with a little bit. Uh, paid acquisition is something we're investing as we speak. We're looking for profitable channels as we speak. So mm -hmm. we're doing still a lot of experimenting, a lot of, uh, doesn't always work, but some, we have some early promising results. So we'll, uh, we'll keep That's investing good. in that. So, yeah. And, yeah, uh, paid, yeah. Paid yeah. acquisition is tough. It's, uh, you have to have a pretty good budget for paid acquisition because so much of it doesn't work or so much of it doesn't get you that positive ROI, 
but you can't just like start off and like find 10 paid tricks that work, right? You have to like try a hundred and 10 of them will work and you'll probably waste your money on 90 of them. So, but you, that, that's the investment you have to make to eventually make paid advertising work in the long term. Maybe people, I'm sure there are exceptions out there, right? And I'm, some people may disagree with me like, oh, I was easy for me. But I think and from what I've heard, from the experiences I've heard of a lot of people, that's the, that would be the exception. Most people have to spend money just to fail in certain places in order to like really find that paid channel, if it even exists, that's going to work for them. Um, so that's definitely a challenge. I think at some point worthwhile for every um, company to experiment with, because you don't really know how successful it's going to be until you do it. Um, we don't do a lot of paid acquisition, which may change in the future, but we haven't done it in the past, mostly because I just don't want to like directly pay those companies. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> fuck Facebook. Like, I'm not paying you money. Like that's honestly like my opinion. So like we don't do Facebook ads, but like maybe they're super effective for us and I have no idea. Right. So as you grow, some things may change. Um, and the podcasting, like going on like podcast tours or like being on podcasts to get in front of audiences, I think there's a lot of benefit to it. I've been experimenting with ways to try and like make this podcast a little bit more, like how can I provide more value for like my guests? Like how do I get more folks listening to like everyone listening, go to marker.io, you know, yeah, I can say that on the podcast, but okay, I want to put it in show notes too, so people can easily click to it. Like I'm building out this community. So we actually have like a place to hang out because if people hear about this on the podcast, they may check it out. But like if they're interacting in this like circle community and like we're working on stuff and people see marker.io and like the cool, like awesome animations and gifts you have on all your like, you know, integration pages, they see that and like, oh, this looks cool. I heard about it on the podcast. It's also here in the community. Maybe I want to go check it out. And I think that helps even more. So podcasts are this, how well do they really convert? I don't know. But I think like paired with other things, they can be pretty powerful. So yeah, exactly. It's very, more of like cool. a branding, branding play. You want to get your name out there. You want people to start, you know, maybe it's six months down the road, they hear market.io somewhere or something. And it's, you know, because sometimes I think, because I think I, I, I try to think a lot about these things and I'm, I'm thinking about the products that, you know, startups use every day, right? So like uh, Figma for designers and, and, and I'm always thinking like, how the hell did I start knowing about these tool or intercom or, you know, and there's, I'm always trying to go back to that moment when I first heard about them. And it's rarely because I purely did an SEO search, you know, maybe SEO kind of complements with it and, uh, and your SEO and your paid ads can become more effective down the road if, you know, the, they recognize the brand name because like, you know, you might be more willing to click on something you you're recognizing. So I'm not putting all my my eggs in the same basket and thinking, you know, we should do like podcasting. It's the new thing. It's the new channel. But it's more like, and I think it's fun. You know, it's it doesn't feel like like work too much. It's just like two buddies chatting a little bit. So that that's fun. And uh, yeah, but you're right that marketing channels. There are million marketing channels, and it's useless to try to do like test them all like you should at least develop an hypothesis for which one sort of makes sense for you to to try and then try them because whatever you're going to do like it's going to take 10 times more uh, more time that than you would have thought originally so you know let's do seo yeah but let's do seo anyone can crank out a 500 word blog post but can you really do SEO? Like it, it really takes a lot of, you know, research, strategy, on-page optimization, flow. Yeah, it's a lot of things. Totally agree. I, I think probably 99% of businesses, you look at 99% of definitely small business, smaller businesses, small to medium-sized businesses, they don't have 100 acquisition channels that work for them. They have like one power one, and like maybe one or two other ones that are pretty good. And that can drive you to be a seven figure a year business. That can probably drive you to be an eight figure a year business. I think like right around when we hit a million, you know, like a million dollars a year. Or so we started to like, okay, like we have to like diversify this a little bit, but we're similar to you, like still investing pretty heavily in those things that have been 
that have worked well for us and that haven't plateaued yet. So I think that's a good way to, to think about it. I like the feature on your website where you can actually just like try marker.io. Like it's right on the side of the, you know, your websites. So you can like give feedback to like you use marker.io for marker.io and it's clear the product is, is a solid one. And I like that that's been your priority. And I think that like early on WP buffs, like my background was more in like marketing and SEO and I developed a little bit of sales knowledge because I was doing sales calls, not because I particularly like sales calls, but I, I was pretty good at them because I was the founder of the company. So like I can talk to people about why it's a good company and what, why we do is important. But the, a lot of people saw a lot about us pretty early on because I was like appearing on a ton of podcasts or trying my best to, you know, and I was like writing a lot of content on the website and guest posting on other sites and trying to like maybe sponsor some WordPress events. And people just like saw WP buffs around a lot. And for better or for worse, don't get me wrong, in some cases, it's definitely worse. But when people see something a lot of times, they just it like kind of gets into their head a little bit. And I would go to WordCamps and people would be like, the first WordCamp I went to with my like WP Buffs t-shirt, no one knew who we were. But like after two years, people were like, I see you everywhere. Like how do, why do I see you everywhere? Like that's crazy. Like you're doing something right. And it was just kind of like, that's all it was. It was just kind of like grinding it out a little bit to like be seen in a lot of places. And that creates this positive connotation. Like if I, if people have seen me in a lot of places, then they they must be a pretty good, they must be a pretty good company, right? You know, I think we're a pretty good company and we do a lot of things right. And of course we have some challenges like every company, but, and so of course you always want to be product first and run a good company, but there's definitely something to be said about like, people heard you on this podcast and then the next time they see you, they're already going to have a positive connotation. And that is, it's like the, it's like in SEO terms, it's like the long tail of like potential customers. It's right. It's like some people are going to see you once and like go and start a free trial, but it's probably like not most people, like most people are going to need to warm up to you. And so how do you get that like long tail engine going? Podcast appearances might be a good way to do that. So people who heard you today may end up being market IO customers in three months or six months or, you know, 24 months, but they heard it here and that's what like kind of drove them. So who knows, maybe that's how it works. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You never know. And I think if you can manage to invest a little bit of both, you know, it's not like, should we do SEO? Should we do community and branding? It's the way I think about it is like SEO and integration marketing works. Let's spend 80% of our resources in there. And then for the remaining 20%, let's try something else, you know, and let's experiment a few things here and there and see see what's what's working. And that's also uh, why I'm trying to build a team. And we just hired uh, Joe, as I said earlier, is, you know, so we can start taking some of the load of my, of my work that is more mm -hmm. focused on product marketing and blog posts that are purely product, newsletters, all these uh, things that tend take time and it's time that you don't spend being out there and getting your message out there. So it's also about, you know, the, all the people that you hire, you try to hire them to, you know, uh, do a job that you were doing before. Cause that's also, but we might talk for this for 20 minutes, but when you hire for people that you hope are going to solve a problem that you have for us, it never worked out. Cause at, at some point we're like, you know, sales, uh, you know, our problem is sales, you know, uh, we're bad at sales. If only we could have a sales guy. And then it's very easy to make sense. You, you draw the economics and you're like, yeah, we've just, we paid them. We can pay them a million, a million a buck, a million a year, you know, if they bring us two million. So it's a very easy argument to be made, but we have no experience in sales. And that didn't work out. And it's just not because we didn't hire the right person or anything like that. It's because we hadn't built internally the machine that helped us be successful at it. And that's why now when we're hiring people, we try to hire for people that are going to pick up some of the workload that we we're doing before. And, um, and yeah. Yeah. I know we said we were going to keep this to about 45 minutes, but do you have like five or 10 more minutes to talk a little yeah, bit about I'm hiring? Good. I'm good. I have, like, yeah. Cool. A lot of people are always asking questions about that. It's people who have mostly reached that 10K MRR mark and are, looking to see like, how am I going to become a million dollar business? Or maybe they don't even have that goal. They just know that they want to grow a business that's going to be a little less stressful than that, like push to 10K, which is like, I'm doing a little bit of everything. How do I continue to grow the company without growing my own stress and growing my own, like what's on my plate? 
And I would love to hear a little bit about the successful hires you've made and maybe like some of the things you look back and you said, I guess either like why were they successful or maybe in that sales case, why it wasn't as successful. I think you explained that one. So I was kind of shifting more towards, okay, this hires you've made who have been great, who have really worked for your company. Um, what process did you go through to find those people, to interview those people, to onboard those people? I think those are kind of three big pieces of it. And I'd love to hear kind of what a small company has done to go from three successful a team, a successful team of three to a successful team of six. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. A lot of luck was involved. Like our first developer, uh, it was just a guy we met at a party here. Like we're just chit-chatting <laughs> and then it's like, we just got along so well, then did a second meeting and then we just say, hey, he had a job, like he wasn't thinking about mm. changing job and the fit was really there. And he's just like, let's just give it a shot. And then yeah. he joined the team and he's been there for more than two years now. Oh, to tell me a little bit about that fit. Because I think, like you say, it was kind of lucky. And I think, yeah, there's definitely some aspect of luck there. But I was talking to someone in the WP MRR community about like creating your own luck. And I want to hear about like that a little bit of time you first spent together at that party or whatever. Was it like almost this like magical moment of like, wow, this like, what if we like work together on this thing? And I was like, oh my God, like we're, it was kind of like two things coming together that just like fit like a puzzle piece. Sometimes, you know, that happens and, you know, maybe like, why were you at that part? Like, was there something that pulled you to that party that made you meet that person? Like, I don't know. I loved. I feel like no. It was a pure bit chance. It was really pure chance. <laughs> okay, and it wasn't. Chance. Even, it was. It was my my co-founder who was at that party, and uh, it was just like going to a, a friend's party. And then obviously there were a lot of people he didn't know, so he started chatting. Hey, what do you do for a living? Yeah, I started my own startup. Marco, we do this and this and this. What about you? I'm a software developer. I work at a, an agency. And then we're like, man, like we build software for agency. We're trying to build, you know, uh, uh, our development team. He was like very attracted by our progr the programming language that we use. And so it was just like that fit right off the bat. And it was when my co-founder uh, came back to the office the following week. It's like, man, I met someone. He's like perfect fit. Like the energy is like, he's so like in, on so many levels. I say, man, I need to meet that guy. Uh, we met a second time and I can feel that there was really a good, a good match. Mm. And then, uh, yeah, it took a little bit of nudging to make, because he wasn't looking to, to change jobs. So it was a That's lot That's what I was going to ask about because there's, there's this, some form of like, whether you call it recruitment or it's just like someone's working at a full-time job and they're going to come and like work a full-time job at like potentially like a less stable company. As the first employee. Was, be, <laughs> as the first employee nonetheless. So there's obviously some huge benefits to that. And, and like, it's a huge adventure to be the first employee at a company. Like to me, I'm like, we, that sounds like total fun, but not for everybody maybe. So I'd be interested to maybe here was the, your first hire that developer, were they happy at their job? Was it like a real job to convince them? Or did you feel like they were always kind of a little bit drawn towards like, uh, I, they're going to need a little pull in, but eventually they're going to, they're going to come over. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to speak for him, but at least the way I felt sure. it was like, you know, I I sort of like, I, he liked his job, but more so than other than something else, he liked the situation. He had just moved to mm. a new place next to his job. It was very easy to walk. He had a lot of colleagues. It was very social. Mm. But then I think our pitch just ex got him excited and the business pitch got him excited, but also the technical pitch. So it was very low key the way we recruited him. We yeah. say, hey, you know what? Come to the office Friday afternoon. We'll have a beer. We'll spend an hour showing you a little bit of our code and how we do things in there. And he, because he's a very curious and interested person, he just like got so excited by what he was seeing because as a as he was working in an agency, it was a lot of you know hmm. new projects, beginning, uh, middle, and next project, next project, next project. And when you're working in a software business, 
you're always working on that one same product. So if you want to geek out on like some cool animation for a day, that's kind of makes it's worth it because it's going to be great, better UX and better UI for mm. customers that are going to be using. But if you're working in an agency, sometimes you don't always have that opportunity to to give yourself the, the chance to geek out on things that you want to make better. So he was really excited on so many levels. And obviously, you know, we're give, we're giving him and the rest of our team a lot of, you know, a lot of freedom, creative freedom, a lot of we don't set hours. It's a lot of, you know, we just have this framework where we do weekly goals. This is by the end of the day, by the end of the week, where we want to be at in terms of milestones. We discuss that as a team. And then off everyone goes and they just do what they have to do. Cool, man. Uh, Gary, thanks for being on the pod, man. It was really cool talking to you. We got to talk about, we got to talk about a whole, a whole bunch of stuff and it was all really informative uh, and really cool hearing about, yeah, the company, how it started, where it's going, all that stuff. So uh, let's start to wrap up. But before we do, I want to make sure folks can find you online. So where can they go to find Marker? Where can they go to find you, social media, all that jazz? Right. So um, marker.io, very simple uh, website address. Uh, same thing on on uh, Twitter, and my handle on Twitter is Gary Gaspar in one word. And uh, I'm also a, a, a bit active on LinkedIn. Cool, yeah. Folks, go to marker.io. Just head hit up that integration tab at the top. If you're a WordPress professional, like you're clearly using one, two, maybe three of these. So if you're having any challenges with customer feedback getting client feedback like just make it easy like give the and you have a free trial right gary so exactly can try it for free, free. Trial. go for it so i think it's a good solution for a lot of folks um cool last but not least i always like to ask you our guest to ask our audience for a little apple podcast review so if you wouldn't mind asking folks i'd appreciate it yeah i mean uh go ahead and give five stars review for sure <laughs> Cool, man. Thanks. If you uh, go to WPMRR.com forward slash review, redirects you right there if you are on an Apple device or a Mac. Uh, leave a star rating. Feel free to leave a comment. If you like this episode, you learned something from Gary or learned something from me, make sure you uh, leave it in the comments so I can uh, send Gary a little screenshot. I'll send Gary a screenshot in marker.io so let him know and give him a thanks for us. So uh, WPMRR.com uh, forward slash podcast. If you want to uh, go and listen to an older episode, binge some older episodes. We've got almost 160, I think, or so episodes in the hopper. So go ahead and uh, search for something you're having a challenge with. Uh, we got a search bar right there. Uh, you can find and listen to some older episodes at your leisure. Uh, WPMRR community. Uh, if you, Gary, I don't, I, I can't remember if you said you wanted to do an AMA or not, but <laughs> I'm asking, I guess I'm asking now, you have any interest in doing a, a, an ask, ask me anything in the community? Yeah, Parker. for sure. I'd love to. Yeah, for sure. Let's cool. do it. Do it. Do it live. So, okay. Uh, Gary will be doing uh, an AMA in the community. The timing is might be a little up in the air. Usually, I like to do it when these episodes go live, Gary. But this may be a go live around the time when the summit is. So I'm still figuring out some scheduling stuff. But at some point, you'll do an AMA in there, and or WPMR summit is now in the next week in the next two weeks i don't know exactly when it's gonna go live but that's coming up soon so that's the last thing i touch on is just virtual summit um all of that community amas virtual summit you can find at community.wpmrr.com um you can also just go to wpmrr.com we've got a little icon in the bottom right that opens up that community for you so nice and easy cool that is it for this week on the podcast we will be in your earbuds again next tuesday gary thanks again for being on man it's been real Thanks a lot, Joe. It was a pleasure. See you, everybody.